Hey, I am so excited today. We are joined by Justin and my name is Colleen Tatum. For those of you that haven't listened to the podcast before, maybe you just forgot. This is Colleen Tatum and this is Rising Through where we explore the relationship between struggle and success. It's Struggle is something that a lot of people try and avoid at all costs, but what I've learned in my entrepreneurial journey and in my life journey is that it's actually required for you to get to the next level. Instead of avoidance at all costs, it's part of the winning recipe. And Justin has a wealth of knowledge on the topic. He's He has done some really great things. He has uh, built a company up. Um, over many, many years where they were serving over 75 million meals a year to hospitals, um, doing such great work. And I'm sure learning along the way, we were talking before about the ups and downs of business. It's never a straight line. It's never like a mountain. Um, But Justin, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to dig into your story a little bit. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the invitation and you reaching out and and asking me to be on the show. I usually am the host, so it's always cool to be the guest, you know? Oh, okay, okay. (laughs) So now I'm on the spot. Like, you're going to be critiquing my work as we go along? No, it'll be good. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, no, no. I am, like, one of the things I very much learned in in life is just enjoy the humans and enjoy their, their growth, right? Like, that's part of the learning to be successful is the acceptance of you know, what's in your control and what's not, you know, okay. and if someone asks, of course, they ask you for your opinion, you can give it. But otherwise, it's it's not free to give because you don't know if that person's in a place to receive it. So <laughs> there's a lot of that, right? Especially as Absolutely. I mean, I think as um, we're business people, there's so many different um, ways that we can take that. But uh, what I've learned is that constant growth requires constant uh, reflection, right? Um, Being open to having different people's opinions and and people that have gone before you, that's the biggest way to grow. It's kind of like that is the one of the cheat sheets, I believe in business or in life is to have that constant reflection, have people around you that you trust that can give you feedback. So thanks for that, Justin. You can send me your critiques afterwards. I'll be looking forward to reading them. <laughs> but Justin, um, let me ask, first of all, tell me what what originally got you started in food service? What was that draw for you? So, I mean, the l- long and short is, um, I guess, the short and long, if that, that doesn't even make sense. But I'll give somewhere in between, but I grew up on a farm, a horse farm. Uh, We had other animals too, but mainly horses. That's what my mom did for a living. She was the entrepreneurial influence in my life for sure. Uh, She built a business, a lot of customer service, particularly during the first two decades, I would say she was really focused on building her business. Um, My father uh, was in food um, when I, and I would, when I went to school, I went to a private school. I'd have to travel there from the farm near to where he worked. And he ended up being the CEO of a company called Caterer, which is now owned by Sky Chefs, which is owned by A-Hold. A- um, and if anyone's in the Northeast, they own giant Martin supermarkets as well, just to give everyone a reference of the size of food company they are. But my father was the CEO of them. They grew to 122-ish kitchens around the world, including in Moscow, Russia, behind the USSR, uh, Australia, uh, all sorts of cool places. And then the United States sort of deregulated airline industry, which put him in a spin. But weirdly, um, we took basically, I was influenced by that. I was influenced by playing soccer in Europe during summers and the nutrition and the health of food over there, even before the European Union in the 90s. And then I had this entrepreneurial influence. So as a kid, I was always mowing lawns, uh, using my parents' tractor. They taught me how to lease it from them and pay them back all the monies and what it was like to build my own businesses from the time I was five. Like it was just, this is how you do it. This is what you need to do. It was less about, I would say I grew up in a loving home, but it was more about how do you function in society? How do you go be give, how do you gain value? How do you go give that value away? And how do you create value in other people's lives or jobs or purpose or longevity or dreams? Like one of the things that they always really weirdly instilled in me was that whatever I do as as my life, my job even as a manager in a company is to help fulfill other people's dreams. 
not I can't have mine fulfilled unless I fulfill theirs or I'm conscious about it. So that was always instilled in me at a young age, which made me get into fruit stands with my friends. And we had four of them and we were buying the organic fruits and vegetables back then from what Whole Foods wasn't buying the seconds, as they're called, off the farms. And so when Whole Foods wasn't buying them because they were too big or too small, we would just grab those. And then we in Maryland, uh, it's an abundance of agriculture. So at least at the time now, not so much, but we could grab a lot of orchards and foods and stuff. All of those organic stuff, even though organic back then wasn't what we think of it as today. Um, it's exactly what it is, but it didn't have the marketing behind it. It was just whole foods. Um, that's why the company had that. <laughs> so and all natural foods, but we coined it organic eventually, even though it's the way food was done before the industrial revolution for all intents and purposes. So it just caught on. I don't know what it was. I've always known I was an entrepreneur, even though I didn't understand the word or the meaning. I didn't necessarily know that the word was entrepreneur, but I'm independent. I do well in school, but I don't, I had trouble following if like the group went a certain direction. I generally didn't go that direction. It just wasn't my thing. Like I was more independent growing up on a farm. You learn that about enjoying your moments while you have them and how precious life is and, and what procreation really means across the animal kingdom and all of those type of things. So my perspective was always different. It, it made me feel like I didn't fit in anywhere. It was something I struggled with with a long time, like trying to be like, I want to fit in, but I just don't, you know? And I think by the nature of life, that's just what happened. So 1998, um, I weirdly broke my foot playing soccer. Um, and um, sorry, I broke my foot so I couldn't play soccer. I broke my foot on a farm chasing a dog. And so I couldn't play soccer anymore. So my focus weirdly changed. Like I was doing the other businesses always to help finance my dream and make money. So my parents didn't have to give me money, at least as little as possible. And I could pay my own way to do things, pay my own college tuition. So at 18 years old, broke my foot, um, like helping my dad with this real estate business that he was in after he got out of the caterer, which we discussed earlier around 1997. He got into a real estate co-op office business and an opportunity came across like to do take the basically the airline model and apply it to hospitals, which is that just in time, that food getting there just in time, the plating, the service to start doing better for the airlines because they had been deregulated. Pan Am went under, Eastern Airlines went under and therefore food on airplanes went from the cream of the crop to like here, here, you guys are getting peanuts. OK, so the airline business wasn't successful. However, insurance and healthcare was on the rise and everyone getting insurance and healthcare, care and hospitals were booming across the country. But they were having trouble keeping consistency in all the diets that were in the hospitals from hospital to hospital, particularly in a group like Kaiser Permanente. So the model was centrally produced like an airline have it go out just in time to the hospitals every night for consumption tomorrow for lunch, dinner, and breakfast the following day. So it's just like, okay. And then from there we evolved into get it from a 250 mile to 400 mile radius, make the product as fresh as possible from scratch, make sure it's not nutritionally dense because it hasn't been off the tree or the vine for a long period of time or butchered for a long period of time. The quicker we do that, the better the nutritional density the better it is for the human body, the better it is to be preventative medicine for the patients in the hospitals and them to learn good habits of eating whole foods. And so it just kind of built from there and um, boomed. So I don't remember the original question, but that's sort of how it got started. That was Food Service Partners. I I I'm listening to this as a Canadian. So I'm in Canada. Our yeah. healthcare is uh, pr not privatized. Um, and thinking of the food that I was, and so I love healthcare. I love universal healthcare, but I am just thinking about this for a moment. I'm thinking back to my experiences of having my children and being in the hospital and the food that I received <laughs> was not nutritious. It was not fresh. It was not an example. That's for sure. So I, this whole concept of having um, food like you're describing in a hostel situation is just, 
derailing me. I, I frankly, I, I haven't seen that at, in a hostel situation. Is this how it was in your area? Were you guys pioneering that? Is this what it's like across the U.S. in hospitals? I, I just really, I'm shocked. I got like, let me put it this way. So I, I remember my wife, one of my first C-sections the next morning, I got, I think, um, a boiled egg and a piece of bread. <laughs> like it was just oh, bad. <laughs> it was, yeah. it wasn't a meal. It wasn't good. I don't really eat meat. So I think they were totally confused what to give me. They gave me an egg and they gave me a piece of toast. That was breakfast. <laughs> I, I will say this on a world scale. Um, and the United States is going in this direction. We were pioneering in the way we did food, the way we did central production, as it's called, the way we we use that to increase the quality of the food, but decrease the labor. Um, that's basically the motto. And we had a lot of technology and, and things we did that still to this day, no one else knows or knows how to do. The issue is, is we were so... We, we were trying to get food and health back to them. And we did it over 24 years. However, there are companies around the world and even the United States is taking a step backwards, even though we pioneered this for 24 years until 2022. And I'm starting to redo it again with Freedom Foods but and start to make our way in. But the issue is most of our food in the United States, in our hospitals, in our in our universities, in our long-term care homes or our, our retirement homes and in our actually elementary, middle and high schools. I don't know what they if it's the same levels in Canada, but they've all been turned over to companies like Sodexo, like foreign companies who now have more of the model you're talking about. How can I just pop this out of a tray, microwave it for someone and feed it to the patients? They don't care necessarily about how good it is for you or how it repairs the body. They just care that it meets these dietary standards, which aren't, they're good. They're just not great. They're more based on food pyramids and they're based on rebate systems. Like, you know, Sodexo is a French company. They live off of how much will this company give me to sell their product in the hospitals at the end of every year? It's like a legal, I always refer to it as a legal bribery because it's this weird concept where you don't owe, you agree to the percentage, but the percentage is variable at the end of the year. So they can give you as much as you want, even though you agree to a percentage. So it's like this loophole in food with in companies like Cisco and US Foods and PFGs, they all play the game. US Foods is also owned by Avold, which is owned by the Dutch, which we talked about earlier. Same with Cisco. And so we have a lot of foreign companies that invaded our food system over the last 24 years. So being the only company in the United States that was doing it, it was very surprising um, actually how much over time profit, money, um, greed, lobbying, all the things that I thought the United States stood for started not standing for, particularly during COVID, particularly when they're trying to take our trucks to deliver vaccinations. When I'm like, well, how do we get food to the same patients? And they have no substance to live off of. But I get getting the vaccination there. I can contribute. You can use them during the day. I still need them at night. But this whole thing where we just we think that science is the answer when food naturally and the diversity of food in our diets we would we brought in multiple protein sources we would expand our vegetables go seasonality every three months change the menus we got into local produce what's in season now what are animals are in season now what animals aren't we trying bison elk alligator uh rabbit pheasant quail you know, you name it, there's about, you should at least have 20 sources of protein in your animal proteins in your diet every month, you know, and 40 different fruits and fruity different vegetables to actually get through your body because we're a screen. However, the food pyramid and the way lobbying's done, particularly in candy and soda and um, foreign interests like companies that come in and want these giant government contracts um, that are, we're turning over to foreign companies, which is always interesting to me feeding our populations are the number one thing even in Canada, but yet we turn it over to a foreign entity that has no interest or doesn't even agree with our principles or our ideology in the subject matter. So like, okay, like at some point the money goes back to the boss or the company in charge or the bank in charge, however it looks. And so, you know, that's what happens. And even now we vertically integrated into farms and relationships, but 
the Chinese have come in, the Saudi Arabians have come in and they're buying up farmland and the private equity companies are coming in and just buying the pivots off the farm, which is the little watering systems and yet not the whole farm. And so they're buying the profitable pieces and then doing away with the other pieces. And it's one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. And, um, and I know because it happened in my own company, offer people enough, offer people enough money, offer people enough opportunity. They will spy on your company. They will turn stuff over. They will help that, that new company like Sodexo get your contracts and then move into that company. As I had a lot of executive and managers do, because weirdly, we went through COVID, our teams, they had no vaccinations. We still had to go get food in the hospitals. And even though the nurses wouldn't go near the patients, our people still, even though it wasn't our job to deliver the food to the patients, would still contribute and go across the lines to help in any way possible across the board, especially with the growth and the expansion and less people wanting to help and be away from it. Everyone was so fearful. Everyone in our company really went in. I mean, they're the unsung heroes, the food service employees uh, in the hospitals. I don't even know what to tell people when they say this, but it it's the nurses, the doctors for sure that stuck through it. But it's also these food service uh, employees across the board, across the world that kept businesses going, that, that took the risk, that exposed themselves to it, that just really were like, I believe in human life. I'm going to do my job. And I had, we had loyal employees, but however, the supervisors and managers and executive teams were all at home during those two years. So then trying to get them back into their offices, back into the kitchens, back to a different lifestyle that they hadn't lived for two years, although it had always been our business model became an all out war and almost mutiny in a lot of ways, even with business partners. I had business partners that no longer wanted to be involved in the business. They thought they could do it all through Zoom or all through, you know, remote connection or go to the locations and actually not go there. Just go do whatever they wanted all day because that's what they had done during COVID. And um, um, for a long story short, it's one of the worst things I've ever seen because what COVID did is it everyone went through it at the same time and we all got cut off with our support systems at the same time. And we no longer had the support system. Like if I was going through an issue and you weren't, you could be my support system. However, we were all going through COVID. So we're all dealing with the crisis. So even in our businesses, everyone's like, Oh, this became the excuse. It did become something to conquer. Like we talked about a lot of people had the mindset, we'll just go into the Valley. And let's just stay there. It's more comfortable there. Why climb another mountain? Let's stay there. We've made enough money, which is another mistake I did. I, I, I took care of people too much. My, you know, my family took care of people too much. The business partners too much. You, we gave away too much money and valued people too greatly because ultimately we robbed them of the lessons in life. And that's hard as an entrepreneur. That's hard for people to hear in the world. But if you don't have the drive, you didn't work from the bottom to make it, you bring people in like four, five, six, seven, ten 10 years into your business, they don't have the same gusto and haven't been through those same valleys and things like 9-11 or financial crisis or hurricanes or when they don't experience those and aren't actually living it. And actually, when sh shit goes bad, excuse me, I don't know if I can cuss, okay. but when <laughs> things you. go bad, when things go bad. <laughs> They don't know what it's like to have yeah, to take all the money out of your pocket yeah, and like make haven't... sure everyone gets paid. I think it's like, um, you know, even with children, right? Um, you want to yeah. give them everything, but at the same time, if they don't learn lessons along the way of what it takes to create those resources, then the natural human inclination is to expect it, right? That yeah. it it's this fine line between um, having to work for something and also treating people with honor and dignity and a livable wage and all those kinds of things. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about denying people a livable wage. What we're talking about is denying them the ability to create mental fortitude, we're denying them the ability to go through the struggles that we know are required to make someone a stronger person. Unfortunately, you can't build a muscle without breaking down the fib the fibers of that muscle, right? You can't, you cannot get to the the goal without actually walking through the trials that get you there it just doesn't work that way you always have to have light and darkness you always have to have that dichotomy yeah. and as much as that hurts us to see people struggle it is required for you to struggle for you to get 
to success, right? Um, as you're talking about building a company, a huge company like that, it's it's so many ups and downs. You've got, like you said, financial crisis, completely changing the way your business works and, and going through those ups and downs and ups and downs in a business that teach you how to overcome the next business you, or business trial. You hear the saying of, don't pray for less problems, pray to be able to get better at solving the problems, right? That's really Absolutely. where you can grow. So when you're going through this and now you've transitioned into your building a whole new company, Foodtopia, um, I want to talk for a minute about, you know, we touched on some big concepts there about how food has changed, how corporate nature of food has changed. And, you know, that is a whole subject in itself that I think people really need to be aware of, of what's happening. You know, the industrial revolution, like you said, changed the way we eat and we look at the the result of that if you look at the result of that in the industrial nations we've got more sickness than ever before we've got more people with weight issues we've got more people with immune issues we've got all of these things happening there 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 is an obvious correlation between what we're putting in our body and what we're expecting out as a result and exactly that we've got so many corporations involved in that result that it's hard to turn the ship on that but at the same time when you're talking about some of these farms and the things that are happening um it's time to turn the ship it's time to be aware of what's happening and food is a, a basic need and when we lose the control over that basic need we separate people from the ability to get food that is a huge, huge red flag. And it is frankly um, terrifying if you really think about it. So what is the work that you're doing with uh, Gorilla Brave? Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, so Freedom Foods is where we're re going after institutional food and feeding and even supplementing grocery stores like I did before. And I want to just emphasize that those downward trends help you diversify. Those dark moments help you diversify in business. Like there's businesses I'm in, I can't even imagine that I got in them, but I didn't have a choice. You know, it's time to diversify, pivot in some ways, stick to the core business, but you need to supplement it during the bad years. And uh, you need to make sure that if you're all in food, well, if we have a downward trend in food, what is an upward trend opposite that I could be in to help counter that? And that's the way it started. Like, how do I make sure that we buffer ourselves from these situations? Um, yeah, it's so true on that. A lot of people are scared right now. They say we're going into a recession or we're in a recession. And, and yeah. that point that you just made is so true. If you look at a lot of the really successful companies in the world, they were built in times of trial, they were built in times of recession, because it causes you to innovate the first idea that you have or your primary business line might not actually be the thing that is going to prove you the most success over the long term so what you just said there i think is so key is that causing your company by trial to change direction or innovate sometimes proves out to be your greatest success so I, I think that's great. So can you tell us what, what is the work that you're doing there? Sorry, I, I kind of cut you off, but I, I just no, thought that point was so important that I just wanted to draw yeah. it out a little bit. <laughs> so Gor Gorilla Brave is a networking group, a group of food entrepreneurs that we're, we're starting to work on to, can, to come together across the world. There's more food entrepreneurs than any other profession, any other space ever. Like we can sway world politics. We can sway the way the world eats, we can buy food better in our restaurants or in our facilities as entrepreneurs and start to heal this planet or regenerate it, you know, for future humans. It's not science. It's not all based on food and mass crop production of soybeans, corn, wheat, and um, and whatever else there is. There's one other that's giving my mind right now, but it doesn't help our planet. You know, soybeans, corn, and wheat being the top three, uh, mm -hmm. but we do supplement stuff in and in there as well. And so it's just trying to regulate that out rice. Sorry. And I was going to say rice, but, but I didn't want to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, people don't know this. Rice produces more methane than cows. Like that's just yeah. a, just a, like how, like we're mad at the cow, but the rice produces more methane. Really? So, and what is cow it that actually, produces the most methane? Do you know, like the, how, what if the rice is right. it the water that's required or? 
I don't understand it fully, um, but it does. Another thing about cows is cows actually with their hooves put carbon back into the soil. So they fertilize it and they help take carbon out of the air and pollution and put it back into the soil to make the soil organic or healthier. Yeah. That's part of what cows so do. And, you know, so cows have their purpose. It's not just they take from the world. They actually give immensely to the world. And the other thing I'll just say is, Anyone who's trying to save animals and being on a farm, you plow a field, you kill rats, squirrels, mice, snakes, bugs, like it is genocide on a massive scale. So to say we can't we don't eat a cow yet, we're willing to eat the vegan food or vegetarian is sort of like, eh, I get it. We can grow it indoors. Still death involved. Still death yeah, involved. Absolutely. Which way absolutely. It brings to so, mind, I think, the balance of life. Um, anything on a mass scale can be can be bad, right? It's the yeah. it's the it's the mass of quantities. It's the industrialization of the farm, maybe, um, that is is the most damaging, right? My husband is indigenous. Their connection to the food is completely different, right? When we're harvesting animals, um, like moose or deer or, or chicken from the uh, you know, wild chickens, things like this, uh, the respect and the relationship that is built between those ecosystems and the giving back and the honoring of it in the way of you're using the whole animal, you're respecting it in a completely different way. And your, your thankfulness, that relationship, that harmony between uh, plants and animals and people is just such a different concept. And I think if I was to choose, that's the way to go, right? We, we as humans, we gotta eat food, right? And where do you get your food? But how is the food produced? What are the spin-offs, the ripple effects of what you're doing with that, I think is the most important. I think whole animal utilization, as you talked about, is so key. Then we're actually giving that life purpose. We're not just taking a part of the animal, okay? Um, diversification on our farms instead of slaughtering the chickens or burning them when they die you feed them to alligators and alligator meat and skin becomes something we use instead of fake stuff this is a natural product okay uh you have chickens on a farm with cows they eat the cow patties or the cow poop they pick at it they produce nitrogen which then goes in the soil which the the cows then also put back in the soil and the pigs because of their hoof feet you know so it's understanding that it like the best we can do is mimic what nature has already done in our farms. You rotate the animals, you have multiple species, like a lot of species, and you have multiple crops and you rotate them and you move it around and you take, you look at it regeneratively. Uh, and I think, you know, and we utilize the whole animal. What is the things that can be used? And our pets eat the animals. Our, there's all sorts of parts we don't eat that we ship off overseas now or you know, things like that, or even pork, the pork industry is in a weird situation because the Chinese bought Smithfield and closed yeah. a lot of plants here. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay, well, these aren't meats we can depend on locally. What can we depend on? You mentioned moose. It's a good one. Like we can, we can raise those animals in Colorado. They have elk farms, you know, there's bison, there's all these animals, speaking of indigenous people, that we know we can circulate and we know can grow and we know that their lifespan can be good and give them purpose. Here's the thing, like, if we stop eating cows, is everyone going to have a pet cow to save the cow population? What happens to the cows when we no longer eat them? We domesticated them. We made them dumb. We made it so they wouldn't run. And I'm sorry, but we did. We did that as human because there were our food. That's their purpose. Yeah, There's we have purpose. to honor them. They can still have a good life as they're living, right? We don't have to yeah. we have to abuse them, but we can honor them in their life yeah. and in their death, right? And I think yeah. even um, we think a lot of meat in the waste area, but there's tons and tons and tons of vegetables and fruit that are wasted every year because someone decided that we have to have perfect looking things in the grocery store. Someone decided that we can only eat it a carrot if it's X size and a pepper if it's X size. 
I don't know that we as a collective society decided that, but somewhere along the way, that's how it became. And so farmers are burying tons and tons of pounds of food every year as we have people have food insecurity and they're all the energy that's going into growing all this produce only for it to be rejected. Somewhere along the line, we have to say, this isn't really what we want. We, we don't mind buying the ugly stuff. We're going to eat it anyways. No one decided that their potatoes need to be pretty before they buy them. But yet it's a, it's a, just an accepted way of, of doing things right now. Right. Yeah. We've tried to beautify the food market for lack of a better. We've tried to make it perfect. Um, and like Foodtopia, which you mentioned, that's a TV show. We're working on that. I'll go around the world over 18 seasons for 12 years, hopefully ex telling the story of the entrepreneurs from the farm all the way to the food and, and cities across the world, because we want to expose that. That's also part of how Gorilla Bray works is then networking these groups together, because on a global scale, we need to start eating this way. It will save our planet. It'll it'll save the humans in our future and diversifying ourselves. You know, I always say this, like we take a vitamin and we only absorb 25 percent of it sometimes. Like why we're not meant to absorb vitamins and minerals in that way. OK. And number two is we have obesity, yet people are eating McDonald's like seven times a day. I'm it's an exaggeration, but let's argue they eat it two times a day. You could keep eating McDonald's all day long, but you're not getting any nutrients or minerals or diversification. So your body's not getting it. So, of course, yeah. I'm overweight because I'm still hungry because we don't actually crave food. We crave the minerals and nutrients that come in it. That's our body. And we don't logically put that together as humans. It's not that we're actually hungry, okay? Like for food, we're hungry for nutrients and minerals and vitamins. So if we're starving all the time, even though we're eating, we should probably diversify our diets. You know, that's the easiest thing. And it's so good the way it should be, but we do the same for our farm animals and stuff like that. And the animals who are regenerating have that diversity of exposure to other animals and other crops and stuff like that. So by the nature, we're feeding our food also that diversity. So it's allowing those nutrients to be processed in an animal in a way that we can't process. We don't eat grass. We don't process it the same way. But cows, they turn that stuff into good stuff. Bison, good stuff. So then we eat it for them. And it's a way we can absorb those vitamins that normally we can't get from vegetables or protein, particularly the animal fats that we need so badly in our diets, because whether we realize it or not, those things carry and help slow down some things in our body. Those, those animal proteins and fats, it's good for the brain, but two, it slows down that digestive process. So everything else can be absorbed fully, not just wasted. Um, so it's just that, like, how do we, we can eat less. All of us can. We, it's just a matter of, diversifying and exposing ourselves to good whole foods, but being willing to eat rabbit, be willing to eat a pheasant here or a bison or elk and, you know, asking for it and exposing ourselves to it and our families, our young kids, you know, the more we do this as kids, the more they'll just accept it as the way that it is, but going more and more home. And weirdly during COVID, we started eating less fresh. Everyone all of a sudden's home and wanting things to be faster and more free time. And we really sped up the process and we got rid of a lot of diversification in our food, particularly in the United States. And we've narrowed our fruits and vegetables and our proteins. And it's just sort of like all because when we have more time and we have less struggle, we take the easier, more comfortable path to your point that we're doing this podcast on. Like when we have too much comfort as humans, we try to chase more comfort and more ease and more simplicity and more cheaper solutions and, and all that. And back to your thing on the hospitals and schools and universities, it amazes me. We spend so much money on books. We spend so much money on medicine. Yet in a hospital or in a school, it is the lowest item we contribute money to on a daily basis to our patients to the students, to the people in these things. It doesn't make any sense when that's the whole thing that feeds our body. It's our fuel. It literally passes down in our legacy to our kids. If we think that our genetics through the way that we eat doesn't pass down when we have children, mm -hmm. it does. No different than we've made cows. We just see it faster every two years because we genetically modify them by breeding a certain way. But humans, we just breed longer. We reproduce longer. But that compounding effect over time is no different. And we just don't get it. Even 
like when we're young, like the way we eat or we feed our children, it's going to go get passed on to their children and children's children and whatever. And we're going to have, you know, disease and genetic um, things that make us allergic to food, which is really just, yeah. okay, I've eaten enough gluten. I've eaten enough gluten. Now my body's like, no more. This is not giving me the amount of nutrients I need. I'm rejecting it, you know, in, in its simplest form. It's, so it's, it's really just so bizarre that somewhere along the way as humans, we've been told in the recent history that we're it's that somehow we're disconnected from nature that we can just be mm -hmm. this entity that you know we can eat whatever we want we can just live however we want it has no effect there's no interconnectedness there and you're right from an evolutionary standard um our our bodies are looking for ways to help us live right that's its job evolution is to survive and if we're not getting what we need from the food we're eating, different things are going to be genetically imprinted on us. And, and that becomes now a pattern moving forward that is really hard to overcome potentially. Um, we'll, we have new diseases or increased amounts of diseases coming because we're just literally, like you said, we're filling our stomachs, but we're not actually feeding ourselves we're not actually getting what we need and somehow we think that um it doesn't have a correlation and it's just such a missight and hopefully we can correct it with things like you're doing like this show foodtopia i'm so excited to watch it that's exactly the type of, of show that i love i don't watch a lot of tv but if i am going to watch something that is something that i would watch for sure because how do we get this knowledge from our brain to our heart right? You do it through storytelling. If, if you want to sell anything, you've got to tell a story. And that story will get people thinking about it in a different way, get connected with it in a different way and start to demanding change and saying to stores, hey, we want change. We were okay with the ugly carrots, right? And on the flip side is allowing us to have micro economies that lower the cost to people because when we're rejecting so much food and the way that we're doing things right now um unfortunately for some people it is out of their financial reach to be able to eat good whole food right but if we can go back to you know it, like during world war ii we had victory gardens and we had all these different things where the messaging was hey you've got to learn how to grow food again you've got to learn how to do these things we can have community gardens container gardens you don't have you can live in an apartment and you can grow some food right it's just being able to transfer that knowledge back that we lost somewhere you know our grandma knew it but do my kids know it probably not so we can reclaim that and we can like you said save the world by doing these things but we're also truly going to save ourselves we have to be able to get what we need from food in a different way um and what we're doing isn't working so i'm i am just so excited for this show um and all the work that you're doing with foodtopia and creating like you said um change through food even political change that food is the connector right? When someone's basic needs are met, or when you're bringing them an offering of food, this is why food is such a, a pivotal thing in so many ceremonies is because it's that bridge, it's that connector, it helps create that, that feeling of, hey, this person cares about me. Now I'm more open to receive the information that they want to give me, right? Well, and to your point, exactly, it bridges, it's the thing we've always rallied around, like deals are done, you take dinner you do you celebrate over food it's just the way that it is it's because in our nature we know how important it is it's the essence of our survival but then we also need community and other humans we're social beings so there's that connection that family that friendship that thing that goes around it because innately we know that we need to grow both because we're social beings, but also we need to nurture our bodies at the same time. And, you know, one of the things that we see is all the disease and rise to your other point. It's because we're not compounding things in our bodies. We're taking shortcuts. We think there's a shortcut, but the reality is there has to be hardship for growth, even for evolutionary growth for us as humans. It's, it's not, we are not stuck as who we are. We are evolving still. We can't think that this is it for humanity. The history goes back tens of thousands of years that will prove otherwise. 
And so if we're going to continue that and make sure we keep being better versions of ourselves, it isn't through shortcuts. It's allowing the body to get exposed to things, to grow immunities to them, to expose ourselves to food, to be able to process them, to diversify our diet. So it gets passed on to our children and our children's children. So then they can do it so they can live. And, you know, arguably, if we outgrow this planet, we're going to need to leave it and figure out how to take care of the things on another planet or how to foster this or how to regenerate, which you can't do with just <laughs> one species or just four plants. OK, so the exit plan for humanity is even if we kept people here, you still need to take these food sources with you and they need to be regenerative and build with us at least until we figure out if we're on a planet, maybe they have food sources, but we're going to be starting all over again. Is that going to poison me? Is that going to kill me? Well, so what do we do? We take whatever we have there. No different than when the Europeans came to America, they brought their food with them and grew it here. Um, they didn't only diversify what the indigenous people already had. They used what we had, you know, it's why bison, we, we hunted them to the, the grave. But we didn't realize that we should have been encouraging them to be the same thing that we did with cattle many, many thousands of years earlier if we we're going to do it. I'm not saying it's the right way, but if we're going to industrialize something, we need diversity and we need American proteins, North American, South American proteins, not just the ones we brought over from Europe uh, still that we eat today, interestingly, or Africa for that matter. So yeah, you're so right. I think the interconnectedness of food, it's always been there, right? The tomato is, you know, a, a heritage food to Mexico, but somehow yeah. it, the tomato is, you know, pivotal to Italian food. So obviously there's always been an interconnectedness of our global food economy. And somehow we just thought that we could control it in a different way and move in a, an industrial um, nature. And it hasn't worked. It's not working. Um, the results are clear. The jury is not out. It's it's a subtle deal. It's now how the heck do we fix it? And, yeah. and the work that you're doing is so important. And, and I think really pivotal in it, those stories that you're telling, um, the work that you're doing, you're, tr you're, you're exactly right. Um, bringing people together through Gorilla Brave um, is going to be super helpful in trying to create those relationships, increasing awareness, and then also providing a tool. Because it's one thing to say, you know, this is harming the earth, but how do you fix it? Right. I mean, we could cancel straws overnight. We, we accomplished that, but I don't think we really solved the problem. <laughs> so things like you're doing uh, will help us, uh, help us actually hopefully get to where we need to go. So I appreciate that so much. Um, where, can, where's the best place for people to find you and the work that you're doing, Justin? Well, they can find me on Instagram at Justin Bizarro. That's B-I-Z-Z-A-R-R-O for anyone out there. Like that's generally what I use the most. I don't use much email anymore now that I don't have the businesses the same way. And I'm rebuilding Instagram's just become an easier way to communicate Facebook. Um, but I do have email. It is Justin at Justin Ryan companies uh, dot com. Uh, so you can reach out to me there. I, I'm an open book. I don't. Like I give, I talk, I'm, I'm trying to give back to the world and I feel like charging and, and there's numerous amounts of money and people are doing today and coaching and, and stuff is just not, it's not the same for me because food is already a costly business. So it's about just building groups, building people that can relate to each other that share the same principles. Maybe I don't share your personality or I don't get along with you in that way, but I share the principles in that you're trying to regenerate the planet or you're trying to make food as a vehicle to better the lives of humans and the animals on the planet and the bugs and the creatures and the bees and the birds. And so like, that's a lot of it. And I would say that, you know, your diet, our diets have in that diversity of our diets, um, I'll leave you with this, has a lot to do with our mood and our health and, and stuff like that. And we start robbing that of ourselves and we start seeing culture get, should I say, unsatisfied or dark or, or more aggressive. It's usually because of our diets. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's too much sugar. It's the, the too much caffeine. It's, you know, what are we putting in our diets that's hurting us negatively on a massive scale? And there's sugar and everything from pasta sauce to you name it, even if it's a quote unquote preservative, it's just like, you know, it's things like that. And we never got into the rock bottom thing. So I apologize. We talked about a lot of other stuff, but. Hey, I uh, love it. I, I, 
found so much value. I'm always surprised where the conversation goes. Um, yeah. I think the messaging that you um, put across is is so relevant for today. Um, the re the struggle is always always obviously there of of what you got went through, but um, I think the message um, that most needed to be talked about today came through. So I appreciate that. This is like food food is life. I mean, it's a basic need, and it's something that um, we need to talk more about. So I actually really loved our conversation today. I appreciate it. Yeah. And if you want to change your life or you're having bad moments in life, you know, I found this every single time, the more, and it's not a diet. I don't call it that. It's a lifestyle change. The more I diversify my foods, the better the coming out of the valleys have become the, that rock bottom isn't as bad when I always go back to the basics, which is that diversity of our food, because weirdly the chemicals in our brain, the way our body feels, even in our worst moments, we start building patterns. And it's not about being on a diet or eating less or, or, or everything that's going on. It's simply diversifying what you eat and anyone can do it. You don't need to change your budget. You don't need to do whatever. You don't need to go organic. It does not matter. Just start with whatever you're eating, but stop eating the same thing. Always. That's mm -hmm. it. And you start doing that. You start finding life to be more adventurous. You start breaking bread in more ways. And to my last point, like Foodtopia, one of the things that's great about it is we we have three pivot, we, we have three points. It's eat, love, learn, but it's really about education, exposure, and experience. How do we deliver that to people? Because that's the key that, to making a difference. How do we educate people on what's really going on, which most food shows don't do? How do you expose the population to the world and what's going on from the farms to the restaurants and the things that are wrong and right? And then it's experience. How do you encourage people to go to countries and not just go to a museum to see paintings on the wall? I get it. That's our heritage. It's important. But what's way more important is we eat our way through cities around the world. We go experience those cultures. We go to the farms. We go live the life because that's truly what matters. It's we can paint and I appreciate it, the artistic talent. I'm not taking anything away from the artist, but I'm also saying from the human standpoint and making us well-rounded worldly humans, we need to go break breads with the locals. We need to go experience local cuisine and diversity in food that's different than our own. We, we don't, we go to a foreign country, we eat McDonald's and Starbucks and I'm like, what is going on here? We stay on the resort and we don't go anywhere. I'm, the the resort, I'm like, get anywhere. me out of here. I want to go, I want to travel. I want to see the country. The f eating in different places is the reason I travel. Yeah, <laughs> that is the root of why I travel and my family we love eating different places that's where you're going to really learn about a culture um and really feel like you went somewhere um there's world schoolers that do that there's so many different um spin-offs of that but if you're going to spend the money to travel actually experience where you are and the easiest fastest way to do that is through their food that's going to identify so many things. So you're so true. You're so right. I'm so, I, I would just want to hang out with you. You can take me on a world tour. You can help me eat food and it's going to be a great time. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that's, that's you. After the show, that could, that'll be your next business. Justin's okay. world food tours. We're going to eat through the world. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Actually the partners on the food Tobia TV show, that's exactly what we're building sub content in and interactive and food mapping. Like his role is exactly that to do these, yeah. what'll be called for world. Um, and so awesome. world. So uh, it's not, we're going to do a TV show. We're actually, I'm putting my money where my mouth is and, and so putting the food where is we're going to actually open this up. So people can actually do this because we don't do enough of it. And it's again, it's not about the money. But it's about making sure in any business, I diversify, we have the right pieces on the chessboard to think about the future play, which is, okay, now people want to do this stuff like you just mentioned. So I have to bring in someone, who, a co-host who has experience in these touring and this, these stories and, and translating it into this stuff. And that's all what it's about. And sub content on YouTube and interactive content on YouTube or on the website where I'm like, okay, let me click this tomato to your point. Oh, Italians didn't eat tomatoes and make pasta sauce until the 1490s. And even then they weren't called Italians. We were like still Romans and city state. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Naples, you know, Italy didn't exist until the early 1900s, late 1800s. I'm pretty sure like 1897 or something. I don't, don't quote me on that, but somewhere around there. 
Yeah. But um, so that's the point, like food and boundaries and the way we eat and that we associate Spanish food and Portuguese food and, Af you know, South African food and Mozambique food. It's all boundaries are, are somewhat figments of our imaginations. But the food that grows in all those places is the real thing, the reality of which we live by, you know, so um Thank you. I keep, I could keep going forever. It. Me too. I feel like I could geek out on this forever. If anyone's listening, just a quick idea. I think if you're saying I would love to, uh, to eat my way through the world, I have seen families do. So we're a homeschooling family. So I've seen some different stuff, but what I've seen. And one thing that we did at one point was we just picked the map and we would learn about that particular place. You could get your family a scratch off map or what, however you want to do it. And just maybe once a month you come together as a family and you eat foods from a different country and you learn about that country. You learn about the foods that are there. It's going to push you out of your comfort zone to make some things that you probably wouldn't make. And for us, it's been a really cool way of, of, um, forcing ourselves to eat and learn about different things that maybe we wouldn't have normally. So if that helps anyone kind of figure out how the, how do I start changing my food? I only eat X, Y, and Z as a family. And now all of a sudden I want to eat different food, but I really don't know what to do with it. That might be a good way. There's so many places on YouTube that you can do this and learn how to do it and just start with start small and just keep going, right? Depending on the culture that you're raised in, their family that you're raised in. My family is multi, really multicultural. So we ate a lot of different foods, but there's some other places like, um, you know, I live in a town that has a lot of people from a place called Newfoundland and they like, <laughs> no offense, Newfies, but they like salt is like the only spice in their spice cabinet. They do not have chili pepper or cumin or all these other things. They're like pepper is, is like a, a culinary experience. Um, and certainly I don't want to overgeneralize, but you know, if you look at different people's households, they might not eat like my household. And so just start small, start where you feel comfortable, but um, maybe join a food class, uh, a, a multicultural food class of some sort, you are going to be able to discover things that you like, and you're going to be able to improve your health that way. And hopefully, as we as a culture get better at learning about our food, um, exploring different ways to eat, we can also like Justin was saying is really actually create environmental change. So thank you so much, Justin. It's been great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Have a good one.